call this meeting of the Powhatan County School Board to order. All members are present. Mr. Walters is attending electronically, and that was voted on at the last meeting. Um, can we rise and the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Father, we thank you for the beauty of this season and for the opportunity to serve you and to serve our community. We ask that you bless and guide us to work on behalf of our students and our community and to always follow your lead. In your name we pray. Amen. Cost as low as I can get them. Program cost as low as I can get them. 
Okay, does that make sense? So that's why, and the school division has been with local choice since its inception, my understanding is, which is 1989. And the county was in local choice, left local choice, went out on their own, and when Stephanie Davis was the finance director on the county side, she wisely said, we need to join with the schools and go back into local choice. And that was probably about 10 years ago that we've been purchasing together. So just as kind of a primer before I start into my slides. Um, what you have here, I get together every quarter with Larry and his team, Terry and Susan, and then Charlotte Schubert on the county side with her team, Linda Jones. Um, and we go through these claims every quarter so that everyone understands what type of a renewal we're looking at for the next July 1, okay? And we just met, we met what? A week ago, two weeks ago? The, the morning of the last board meeting. Okay, so Larry, I knew you would remember that. But what we have here, um, if you look down the center section here that talks about the current period, my underwriter does a quarterly analysis and um, we share this with, with the leadership team out here each quarter. Take a look if you would. Is it okay if I stand over here? Just do this. These are our paid medical claims. We paid medical claims in the prior 12 months were $4.52 million. Currently, most recent 12 months, $5.906 million. Our paid claims are up 30% in this community. That's, that's, that's a big increase, okay? Coming down, if you will, um, so what we do is the underwriter takes those paid claims, gets, gets me a per employee per month cost. We have to trend those claims moving forward because this data that we're looking at currently was pulled through the end of August of 2017 Remember, I'm projecting your July 1, 2018 renewal. I have to add 22 months of trend to that projection. My underwriter has to add 22 months of trend to that projection. Because when I'm coming up with your July 1, 2018 renewal number, I have to make sure we fully fund that through June 30, 2019. 22 months of trend. Bottom line, I know you're not going to like this. Today we're paying about, this is total premium for both the school division and the county. Today our program, total program cost, are about $7.6 million. What we're looking at now with a 30% increase in claims cost, I'm projecting now total cost of about $9.1 million or a 20.5% increase. So that's what I'm looking at for July 1 of 2018 currently. What I'm going to do next is talk about really what are driving our health care costs here in Palatine. My underwriter says that per 100 people enrolled, we should expect about three to four large claims. Large claimants are anyone that incurs over $25,000 in paid claims. So if you extrapolate that out, we've got 650 people on our plan. So somewhere around 18 to 24 large claims are what we would expect in a group your size. Here at Powhatan, we have 40. So we are, that's really what's driving, that's what's driving our increase. And kind of interestingly, when you look at the data, we had those 40 people are accounting for only 3.4% of our members. So the 40 people that have over $25,000 in paid claims, they account for 3.4% of our membership, but they're driving 61.7% of our costs. And that's why I'm here tonight, really. When you look at the list of, and all this is de-identified when I share this with, with the leadership team, no one knows who these people are, but when you look at the list of conditions, there's cancer, there's stroke, there's heart attack. Could we do anything really to prevent that? Possibly, possibly. Um, does that make sense? So we have more large claimants than we should, and a very small percentage of our population is driving, or driving those calls. Any questions on that? 
All right. What I wanted to share with you all was kind of our history in the Local Choice Program. And actually, I'm, I'm very proud of this. Um, this is our rate action for the past 10 years. And then this is our projection for uh, July 1 of 2018. This, is, this talks to or speaks to why we are in Local Choice. If you take that 10-year average, our average increase has been 3.49% in this program. And I've been fortunate most every year to get somewhere around $200,000 off of our renewal when I negotiate on behalf of Powertan. Um, so what we're looking at potentially for next year, and again, we have one more quarter's worth of data to go, it's really an anomaly for us. Again, looking at you know, a 20 and a half percent increase. Any questions on that? Kind of what we are potentially facing? Okay. So, here's what we're facing. What can we do to potentially mitigate some of this, uh, some of this increase in the future? Something that we've never really initiated here in Powhatan is any type of a wellness program. Okay. Anthem has, what, Anthem has programs embedded in, uh, in their program. We have something called Common Health that the, Common, that the Commonwealth of Virginia has embedded in their program. I don't know if you all have ever participated in the screenings when Common Health has come out to do your blood pressure check, your, your, uh, your glucose level. But we've really never taken that concept and taken it to the next level. Um, so what Larry and I were talking about is let's think about kind of a step one, stage one wellness program. And so here are some of the bullet points that we came up with. Potentially, if you are on our health insurance program, we want to make sure that you're getting your required annual screenings. Okay? Required annual screenings. Second bullet point, if you and your spouse are on our plan, you have to certify, certify that you're not a tobacco user. And what we're going to do, potentially, is incentivize those folks who participate in our wellness program. So if you get your age-appropriate screenings, get an annual physical, and you certify that to us, and you also certify that you're not a tobacco, <coughs> we're going we're to potentially look at doing two rate tiers. So you have a wellness rate, and then you have a non-wellness rate. Okay? Any questions? Is that then covered by the insurance? Is the wellness program covered? The, the physical. The physical, the physical is covered at 100% regardless of either of the three plans that you're on. So the physical is paid at 100% by Anthem. But you're just saying it has, you have to get it. If you want to get a, a, a lower payroll deduction, you're going to have to be in our wellness program. That's really what we're proposing. Any other questions on that? Yes, ma'am. Do you, I know with my husband's insurance, when he had his insurance, that he had to, if you certify that you were a non-smoker, you actually had to do a blood test or something to make sure that you weren't a smoker. I was not. I was, that's not something that Larry and I just talked about. If you certify, if you sign our wellness form and say you are not a non-smoker, I can tell you when, I, when, I, when I've done this in other communities, the, the employees rat you out. If, they know you're getting a reduced rate and you're a smoker. Someone will tell them. It's really, to me, I think the best first step is just on the honor system. Let's be honest. Exactly. One of the, and this is one of my favorite strategies to help utilize. Uh, we offer three plans here in Palatine. We offer a Key Advantage Expanded Plan, which is really a Cadillac plan. It's a very rich program. And we offer kind of a mid-level plan that's in the Local Choice Program called Key Advantage 500. And we have fairly even enrollment between Expanded and 500 and on the school side, don't we? It's yeah. pretty close, but we do have more in the Expanded than we do in 500. Right. And then we offer a third plan. It's a high deductible plan. It's health savings account compatible, and we have very little enrollment in that plan. 
And the reason we don't, even and on the for the employee only, our cost is what four dollars a month, ten dollars a month. County charges four dollars a month. Ten dollars a month for a health insurance plan with a, a rich dental program and a rich vision plan, and we get very few people to participate. The reason they're scared of it is it's because it has a twenty-eight hundred dollar deductible. So one of the one of the uh, concepts that we like to uh, to put in place in Powhatan, we already have partnered with a vendor for health savings accounts. So there would not be a fee for the employees to have a health savings account. But the only way these plans are effective is if the employer contributes some money to the health savings account, gives the employees some seed money. And then the way you win if you're the employee, you look at what it would, it's $10 to be in the uh, health savings account, program. Look at what it would cost to be in the $500 program or the expanded program. Don't send that extra money to the insurance company. You put, as the employee, you put those additional dollars in your bank account instead of sending them to Anthem, which ultimately ends up at the state. Does that make sense? But again, to get people interested in that type of a program, we're going to have to put some money in the kitty to help them. Right across the river, I work with Goochland. Great example. On the school side in Goochland, we probably have, they're a little bit smaller than you all, we probably on the school side have 300 and some employees on the health insurance. They offer one plan less than your expanded, but they offer the 500 and the high deductible plan. We've got about 10% 10, 10 of our people in Goochland that enroll in the high deductible plan because the school division puts in $100 a month into that bank account for the employee. Does that make sense? I don't know. What, what, what questions? So, we have to put in $100 per person. You don't, you, don't have to, you don't have to put in a set amount. I'm just using that as an example. That Goochland puts in $100 a month, whether you take single coverage or through family coverage. They fund $1,200 a month against your $2,800 deductible. Does that make sense? We can do more, it just depends on what room we have in the budget. Yes, sir? Uh, is the $2,800 per uh, family member deductible or is that the family deductible? That is, that's per individual times two, so if you cover two or more people, it's $2,800 for each of you, or $5,600 for your family. And at, uh, at that point, is the uh, is it 100 percent covered or 80 20 total? It, it's 80 20 until you hit 5,000 dollars total out of your pocket. Okay. And really, what this does, this really, this really gives the employees some skin in the game in how they're using their benefits. Because today, with your program, you know, it's like they have the division's credit card, and there's no limit on it. Right? So what you do is, you know, you incent them to put money into their health savings account. A health savings account, unlike a flexible spending account, <coughs> those dollars roll from year to year. There's no use it or lose it provision. It's a great savings tool because you can also pay your Medicare premiums with that money when you retire. Um, but again, then the employees are spending their money out of their health savings account instead of the division's money with just a copay. It's really kind of taking traditional health insurance and turning it on its head. I've been in a plan, my family and I have been in a plan like this for probably 15 years. We're all healthy. Um, I have a nice balance in my health savings account. I love being in a program like this, but to get an employee started, we would have to put some seed money and we would have to contribute to a health savings account. Or the way we do it today, we just don't get any enrollment. Very little wrong. We've got 18 contestants in the high deductible plan. A couple of comments. Even if we put $100 a month in the account, we're still saving money over what it cost us to pay that either one of those other two plans, correct? Um, not at the family tier, you're not. Uh, but I've done some calculations of lower amounts. I've also looked at a uh, study that was done in 2015 of surrounding school districts and the at that time, the average contribution of the divisions was 
$69 and some change. So, you know, we can start off at, at you know, any level, and I've, I've done some calculations, and so we can start off at whatever level, you know, we can afford to, uh, to try to get some uh, more interest in this. One of the other things, back on the incentives, one of the other things that I'd like to see included in that is attendance at a benefits meeting, uh, so that folks understand what the options are. <coughs> I, I think that too often everybody gets busy and it's always going to be the way it is. I'm not going to change it. I, you know, I, I don't think sometimes we know the options, and, 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 I, and that's part of it because we don't study those options and we not and we don't take the opportunity to listen to someone. The, the other thing is. If you are a first year teacher or second year teacher, or right, if you're young, the highest the, the high deductible is you know, you'll never you'll never get back unless you have a catastrophic illness or a catastrophic accident, you'll never get back what you spend in, in health insurance probably through age you, you know the figures, I know probably it's probably through thirty five or forty, you'll never get that money back. Uh, so uh, you know it, it's funny because about when I was a younger teacher, I went to Blue Cross and Blue Shield said, why don't you offer us a plan where I'll pay the person for $4,000 and you pay everything else? They didn't have it back then. And they didn't have health savings accounts back then. Right. I didn't know I was such a visionary. I called me a millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I've got one question. That, this choice was made for me by my company because that is all they have is one plan. It's a high you, plan. You, you, this is becoming all that private employers are offering. Now, what I would what I would suggest or ask is and the one thing I don't like about it is appreciating money that is put into the account, uh, you know, funded toward the HSA, and I'm contributing an extra hundred dollars a month out of my own salary for it. But the money that's contributed by the employer is put in monthly. Okay, so good. They, they divide that, you know, so if they contribute twelve hundred dollars, they're putting in a hundred dollars a month. But Expense-wise, that's not the way it has to go out. A lot of times it has to go out in a lump in February. And I think employers have the option to fund that 100% at the beginning of the year uh, or to spread it out. And it's easier on the employee if it's, it's there and it's available at the beginning of the year. It's really the employer's option. You can most do contribute monthly. Some will front load maybe a quarter of the annual contribution. I mean, at the end of the day, it's the same money in the budget. It just depends on how we want to do that. Front, uh, front loading would be my preference. If I had a choice in my own plans, but if we do have the limits here, that's what I would suggest. Does the HSA cover any, I mean, other than the employee paying up, do they cover any routine, a routine physical, or is there anything that's not out of the employee's pocket? Yeah, routine physicals are covered at 100% by the insurance company. So Anthem pays for your routine wellness check, mammogram, PSA, all that's covered at 100% okay. by the plan. Okay. But anything other than that, anything diagnostic, routine office visit, that's going to you're going to pay your first your $2,800 deductible. But the nice thing about it is, then at the point of sale, you either go, okay, I'm going to use my debit card if I want to pay with after-tax dollars. Or I'm going to give them my health savings account card if I want to pay the pre-tax dollars and pull it out of my bank account. You really have the option at the, at the point of sale, at the point of service. Does that make sense? And additionally, um, some other advantages of the health savings account, uh, it's considered family. So the only requirement that the IRS has is you have to be in a qualified high deductible medical plan for either your employer or for you to contribute on a pre-tax basis to a health savings account. But once it's in your bank, you can use that to pay for your spouse's or your children's coverage who may be on a traditional plan. The money rolls from year to year. So I work here, but my wife works in Chesterfield. And she's on an HR plan with health keepers in Chesterfield. I put money in my health savings account. She can take my card and use it for her co-pays for her HMO plan in Chesterfield and for our children that are covered in that plan. What about the 
What is the yep. maximum uh, contribution amount for an employee? 30, uh, right off the top of my head, 3950 I believe is the latest for an individual, 6950 for a family. But I can tell you. 4,670. For 6,750. Thank you. And that's per year. Per yes. year. Per year. <laughs> but I can tell you, um, there's a lot of chatter in Washington about this. President Trump just signed an executive order on the 12th, kind of you know changing the ball game a little bit with health insurance. Health savings account are they're a hot topic. It's been proposed. No limit. Uh, but today, those are the limits that the IRS sets for them. Okay? Any questions on how a high deductible plan would work? And again, you can use that money for qualified medical, dental, pharmacy, or vision expenses. And, and the key point is that money goes with you when you leave. Correct. And I mean, it, it you know, will carry over until you, you've used it up. Okay. Here we go. One additional option that we would have, again, we offer three plans. We sponsor three plans in Thailand. Remember, when we make a benefit decision, the schools are going to have to agree as well as the county because we are one group with Anthem and the local choice. We can kind of be creative in how we fund our programs as long as we fund the minimums to be in the program. But the county and the schools would have to agree on the plan offerings that we sponsor. I have very few accounts left that offer the Key Advantage Expanded Plan, which we have most of our enrollment in that plan. Most have dropped back from the Expanded Plan to the Key Advantage 250 Plan. So I wanted to show you uh, kind of the two kind of, kind of basic plan summaries side by side. There would be a premium savings of about 8.5% to move from the expanded plan to the 250 plan as our best offering. Okay? That's exactly what the Goodson does across, across the river. So for Key Advantage Expanded, you've got a $100 single, $200 deductible. Moving to Key Advantage 250 would be a $250 deductible for single, $500 for family. Out-of-pocket maximum for the expanded plan is $2,000 for a single, $4,000 for a family. Out-of-pocket maximum is nothing more after your co-pays, your deductible, your co-insurance. Once you pay that amount out of your pocket, and including prescription drug benefits, Anthem then pays everything else at 100%. That would move to $3,000 and $6,000 for the 250 plan. Office visit, go, office visit co-pays go up $5 for a PCP visit, $10 for a specialist visit. Inpatient facility, if you go in under our key advantage expanded plan in the hospital, you pay $200. Anthem pays everything else at 100%. That's a very rich benefit. It would move to $300 under the 250 plan. Outpatient services, emergency room visits would go from $100 under key advantage expanded to $150 under Okay. Important to note, the pharmacy benefits are identical and the dental benefits are identical for those two plans. So this just gives us another kind of arrow in the quiver if we need it when we get to, um, get to the actual renewal numbers. Just in terms of a timeline, we just reviewed the data through the end of August. That's the data I was sharing with you. The renewal data will be pulled through the end of November. My underwriter will have her number probably third week of December, and we should have the actual renewal from Anthem and the local choice first part, first to middle part of January, hopefully well in advance of the budget discussions for next fiscal year. Okay? Any questions on anything this evening? I do want to add um, just a couple of points. Um, uh, you all know that we have a flexible spending account now, and, and those dollars uh, that are set aside by the employee are tax-free dollars. The health savings account's dollars uh, also would be tax-free, as well as if the employer 
were to uh, contribute uh, some amount, that contribution by the employer is tax-free dollars as well. So that's an important point to note. Wanted to touch on one thing that you mentioned, Mr. Cole, about uh, briefing employees, and this also came up uh, at uh, the last board meeting. Um, David has, you know, many, many times come out of our school systems, and they've had open enrollment meetings, and hardly no employees show up. But what we've talked about uh, going forward, so that we can, in fact get employees really briefed on this, and Dr. Jones had uh, said that we would go to uh, meetings at each school uh, when they're already having a staff meeting and get on that agenda so that we've got the full audience there to listen to so that we can explain uh, how in church uh, this is working and what these differences are uh, for these plans. Because I'm not sure that everyone really understands it and so we do you know have that um, at the last meeting the board also asked that we develop a questionnaire which we you know have drafted up and we've got right now about 12 or 13 questions on there uh, for employees and it does talk about uh, some of these cost uh, control options that the board you know, could have um, as we go forward and start uh, prepare drafting up a budget for consideration. Uh, I do want to include some uh, cost numbers for um, an incentive to go to the high deductible plan, as well as uh, some cost numbers for a uh, wellness program. And uh, just so you know, um, looking at what the state plan is, I uh, looked at for uh, the plan for two years ago, um, the uh, incentive uh, for a wellness program that the state is paying is about $17 uh, a month. Uh, if we had half of our employees that went into a wellness program, let's say we used a $20 monthly incentive, uh, we're talking about a $50,000 uh, cost if uh, half of our employees in all tiers uh, were to do wellness certification for us. On the uh, incentive for uh, employees to move to the high deductible plan, um, right now we have uh, actually 21 uh, participants in the uh, high deductible plan. And let's say the, um, you know, like I said, the survey of surrounding school measures was about $69 uh, per month was the average. If we used a $70 month incentive uh, to move to the high deductible plan, um, then the cost for those 21 that's already in there is $17,000 for the year for the board. Um, however, any additional employees that were incentivized in order to move into that plan are going to start reducing their cost because the employer cost for the K expanded and K500 or greater. So you could reach a break even point uh, and even be uh, saving uh, you know, money if more employees uh, chose to go that route. Yes, sir. I'm sure you have it in your numbers, but not on the presentation. What percentage of our employees in the history would not meet the deductible if they were on a high deductible? That, that's where I see the savings coming to the I, I don't know. I, I don't know that number, but I can tell you historically, it's very low. Because people, our sicker employees are going to are going to select one of our two richer plans. They're not going to go into our high deductible plan. The healthy people tend to go into the high deductible plan. Now, sometimes you elect the high deductible plan, and something unforeseen happens. But um, we we know. Probably when we look at our large claim list, probably the majority of those folks are in our key advantage expanded plan. I'm, I'm just looking for where where is the financial incentive to go into the high deductible plan from the employer's perspective. If it, unless it reduces the employer's cost, and somehow the numbers show that, why are why are the employers pushing that plan? Well, we. Larry, you want to, you want to speak? You want to well, speak? the premiums uh, for the high deductible plan are lower. And so both the employer and employee are paying 
less than premiums because to the least take a higher risk. And so uh, that's the incentive uh, to do so. And the more skin in the game, in the game that an employee has, they're going to, you know, make the wiser, you know, uh, decisions. Uh, for example, uh, going to a uh, wellness clinic patient first or something instead of running to an emergency room. Those type of things, they're going to make those decisions. Um, and, um, so that is... So you're, looking, you're looking at changing the choices of... Uh, method of care. If, if uh, the emergency room visits are available and free or cheap, then that's what the gravitate towards versus. Well, you can see in our, in, our plan, in our best plan today, it's $100 to go to the emergency room. On average, that visit's going to be probably eight dollars $900 versus, you know, a copay if they go to patient first or an urgent care center. It makes a difference. And when, when it's after hours, <laughs> Our employees have very little incentive not to go to the emergency room. Yeah. That drives our costs. Right. Well, there's, there's very little incentive uh, not to go once your deductible is met either because at, you know, around October, November, you might as well go to the emergency room because your, your deductible is met. Yep. Can you only switch plans during an open enrollment period? Like what you were saying, is if I went with a HSA and something catastrophic happened and I wanted to go back, then you would have to wait Unless, yes, ma'am. Unless you have what's called a qualifying mid-year event where, you know, maybe your spouse had open enrollment, you could get on that plan. But traditionally, yes, you have one. The insurance companies don't want to be selected against. So uh, you have an open enrollment. That's when you can make kind of your free choice unless you have that qualifying mid-year event. Get married, birth of a child, adoption of a child. And change in, change in job status. Change in job status, correct. Eligibility for Medicare, I mean, all those things are qualified mid year events. And then if you wanted to go back, is there a pre existing exit? Absolutely not. No so let's say that you tried the plan, you were one of the few that had a bad experience, you can come back into one of our traditional plans next year at open enrollment, and if you still have money in the bank, you can use that money to pay your co pays under the traditional plan. David, you may have said this earlier, and I just want to make sure I understand. If for the um, high deductible employer contribution to the health savings account or the wellness plan, could the school system choose to do that without the county doing it, or would we all have to do Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Okay. You, you all can fund, as long as you fund the minimums that the program requires, you can be creative, as creative as you want to, and the county does not have to do that. We just have to offer the same plans and fund the minimums of local choice to be in the program. Other than that, you can be creative. Do we know how many other school divisions have the wellness provisions built into theirs? Unfortunately, not a lot that I've worked with. Um, they just don't. Um, you know, when you look at the rate history, our rate action, I'd put that up against anybody. We've been fortunate in Powhatan to have, I mean, if you look at a 10-year average of 3.5% increases per year, that's unheard of. We haven't been faced with something like this before. Um, I have very few schools, many are starting to look at it, but I have very few public sector clients that are on the forefront of this. Many, many private sector clients are, but not public sector. Yeah, many of the people that have no wrong with the wellness incentive. They don't get premium, they don't get money put in the health savings account, but they get the same thing. They get, usually get a Visa card or something, the next amount of dollars, gift cards, and spend towards their health, health account. And something else, kind of to take it even a step further, many private sector companies have said, listen, because if you look at our large claim list, many of our large claimants are not our employees. So many private sector employers have said, listen, you know, if the spouse is working and has access to health insurance at their place of employment, they're either going to pay additionally to be on our plan or they're going to be excluded from our plan. So these are some of the things that the private sector is embracing that we're just starting to talk about in the public sector. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
One more thing I'd like to add that, you know, actually David had asked me this question a couple of weeks ago, and it's really, uh, you know, a good question, and that is, you know, our largest expense is payroll. And within payroll, um, the next largest expense is our retirement uh, benefits that cover all employees. Health insurance is right behind that. However, if we uh, are going to have a 20% increase, health insurance will support uh, that two-thirds of our employees is going to surpass our cost for retirement for all employees. So we really need to look at some options to try to do something. Um, Dave, one last thing, if I could. 20% is what you're projecting now, but there's still more data that will be collected. And one, you, one additional quarter. Right, and then you're going to work your magic and negotiate an even lower rate. So while this is a wake-up <laughs> call, that's still a preliminary number. I, I don't want to alarm people, but I also want to make sure that we're getting the word out of what we potentially could face. That's exactly right. Any other questions for David or Larry? David, do you have a, um, has the county asked you to present a similar thing to them at this point? They, they have not. Okay. Ted is aware. Okay. Charlie is aware, but they have not asked for this yet. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll reach out to Ted about that. Thank you for being here. We Thank appreciate you. your Thank time. Thank you all for having me. Thank you very much. Tonight we have a um, hopefully a more uplifting presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Jones. You're welcome. <laughs> yes. On college and career readiness, I'm um, going to ask uh, Mr. Tibbs and Dr. Mahundred please come up, and uh, they're going to share some data from um, some of our student achievement numbers from last year um, around college and career readiness. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Tibbs and I are going to present some information about college and career readiness. Um, and we want to start with a little bit about. Um, just these are some of the indicators that we generally use to share with you all about college and career readiness graduation type, rates, diploma types. Uh, we'll talk about our CTE, uh, which speaks to our career readiness some of our dual enrollment and advanced placement, which allows students to get ahead in some cases as they are heading to college, and then SAT results and trends, um, which I'll talk a little bit more about uh, in, the, in the fact that we can't see trends right now because we do have a new SAT, but where we are currently compared to where we were in the past. Alright, so I've shared this with you all um, before. This is the graduation completion index, and this is something that we talked about when we looked at the big data at the end of the year, so you all have seen this. We are at 95%, um, and at the last meeting you did ask for comparisons with other school divisions. This one is not published uh, in the DOE information for that, so I did find a few comparisons, but I've got another uh, graduation index to share with you so that you can understand a little bit about how we are compared to local and regional school divisions. So we are at 95%, um, and that's trending about the same um, as we have for recent years. Um, so our students are prepared and are graduating um, on time according to the graduation completion index. For those that aren't, we are making sure that we're providing some sort of option, usually through the GED program, or allowing students to stay an additional year if we need to make sure that they get their diploma. This is the rate that is, um, that is used for a comparison with some other divisions. So you can see the on-time graduation rate takes into account multiple diploma types. Sometimes uh, some of the other rates don't take advantage of some of our special education diplomas, uh, the, the general achievement diploma, but this one does. It also allows us to calculate students who are still enrolled in school and who may take a little bit longer to graduate and still be considered on-time graduates. They may have some provisions in an IEP that would allow them to stay an extended year. Our average for this, our on-time graduation rate, is at 93.8%, and that is over 2.5% uh, above the state average. If you take a look at local and regional school divisions, 
not just Region 1, but some of our neighbors that may not be in Region 1 or similar school districts, we're fourth out of 13 um, local and regional school divisions. And the ones that are above us, Colonial Heights, Hanover, and Goochland are the three school divisions that are above us, but we are fourth in that group of, of regional school divisions. Also, uh, just to uh, note about diplomatists, uh, we haven't really talked about this in the past, uh, but we do have a strong number of our students who do uh, achieve the advanced diploma, which is an important thing as we're talking about college readiness, because it does include the fact that they need four, uh, four core years of each subject. So you're going to need four years of English, four years of math, four years of science, four years of social studies, as well as two years of two different languages or three years of one language, plus there are some other things in the fine arts that requirements and additional SOL tests that are required. So it is important from a career or a college readiness standpoint that we do have as many students as possible that are taking um, the advanced diploma route and we do exceed the state for the students that are earning an advanced diploma. for career readiness is looking at our career and technical education credentials. For many years we have instituted and tried to increase our offerings for students and offering them opportunities to get credentialing and get certifications when they graduate from high school. And so this is a graph uh, matrix, if you will, that, that we show you every year to kind of depict what we've done and how we've increased from year to year. And so you've got 2014-15 and 2015-16 and 2016-17. And you'll see that as we go across all of our areas, we've increased in every area from state licensures, which includes our CNA license and our cosmetology license within our cosmetology program, to our industry certifications. Uh, this year, we had a major increase in our industry certifications because of an increase in offering students in our carpentry and electricity program the opportunity to get credentialed and get certified. Workplace readiness does not have anything in 2016 and 17. The reason it does not is because we have worked to give students in our programs and all of our programs an industry credential that they can get at the end of their program. Workplace readiness is really a bare minimum credential, a bare minimum certification that students can sit for and can take if we are not offering credentials in an area. But all of our program areas offer a credential so we don't need to give our students the workplace readiness. And I want you to think that they're not getting the workplace readiness, they are. In all of our competencies, the first 21 items that are built into every competency in every course is a workplace readiness skill and it does involve all 21 of them. So students are getting them in their courses and through their coursework throughout the whole year. We just offer them credentials in their specific program area so they don't have to take the workplace readiness certificate in order to meet that requirement to have a credential before they graduate. So our total credentials earned this year was 401. And our CTE completers, we remain right there within the 200 range. And when you look at the CTE completers, those are students that have achieved a course sequence of two courses within a program area. So now that we have, we started several years ago offering at the eighth grade level, ninth grade courses, high school level courses for eighth graders, Students then can start in eighth grade taking a high school CTE course, follow up in the ninth grade year. If it's in the program, then at the end of the ninth grade year, they're a completer. Then they get another opportunity, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade year, to become a completer in another program area. And a large number of our students do become completers in multiple areas and do also get certifications in these multiple areas as well. Yes, ma'am. So eighth grade, we offer independent living. They could then come to the high school and take um, leadership development and then uh, early childhood, and they would be a completer. Or they could take desktop media web technologies in the eighth grade and take advanced desktop media web technologies in ninth grade. They would be a completer. As long as they stay within their track in their program area and take the succession of courses, they will usually become a completer. Most of our students take three and four. Once they get into a program, they like it, they continue to stick through. The down there? Yeah. Yep. Well, I don't 
<laughs> so what I wanted to do with this slide is to give you some program highlights. Starting in 2008 and 2009, in that year, we, as part of our plan, our CTE plan that we have to, to submit every year to the State Department, we have to identify a program cluster area and a pathway that we are going to focus on for that year. And so in this slide, it's just highlighting some of our areas that we have focused on over the past 10 years or so, um, ranging from architecture and construction in that cluster, education and training, human services, hospitality, and tourism. So these are all the cluster areas that we serve within our high school. And then the pathway designates specifically the course sequence that we have within the high school. The program of study actually spans all the way back to the middle school, goes from middle school up through high school. The nice thing about the program of study, Mrs. Wilson, if you'll go to the next slide and click on that link that's right there. The program of study actually highlights and gives for students that are interested their whole succession of courses starting in seventh grade and going all the way up through eighth grade. We have to partner with Reynolds Community College because we're in their service region. And every year when, we, when I do this program of study in conjunction and in partnership with the high school, we send this to Reynolds Community College, to the Academic and uh, Counseling Services Department, and they review this to make sure that we do have an actual solid program of study that would allow students to complete a program from middle school up through high school, graduate with us, and then if they wanted to go to community college, they could go to the community college, and then on the second page of this document, it would highlight for them semester by semester what their course sequence would be if they are interested in achieving an, an associate's degree or potentially a certificate program uh, at the community college level. So, Mr. Tibbs, I want to go back to that. What courses do we have in the facility and local equipment? Is that small engines? Is that yes. Yeah, the, the, the clusters and the pathways are very broad, and so we have to kind of narrow it down. And we'll, when you look into the Verso side of the CTE resource, <coughs> it specifically spells out those courses that are listed there. And every year when we bring courses in or, or we make adjustments to our courses, we make sure that they align to the CTE resource center, to that Verso planning guide, and then we also make sure that they align to master schedule collection and make sure our sked codes are right and all that stuff. So there's a lot of little intricacies to make sure that we are aligning with what we need to align with. The other highlights is uh, we did for this year we had a rework organization of the information technology pathway which is that program of study that, that we just highlighted. In that pathway we have advanced design multimedia web technologies. Students can start out in design multimedia web technologies at the eighth grade level and then go into advanced and then they can go to dig digital visualization and then construction technologies. Um, this program, I would say, is filled this year. Advanced Design Multimedia Web Top Technologies is a course that is pretty much full at this point. Um, digital visualization is, is getting off the ground. Construction technologies, all sections of that are completely full. So we, we are very pleased with those changes. The other thing that we did this year was we increased our CTE staff to include an additional full-time staff member for the agriculture program. This created three specific pathways for agriculture, one in animal systems, one in plant systems, and one in power structural and technical systems. So for our college-bound students, uh, SATs end up being one of the major markers for uh, readiness for college admission and so as you know we restructured or college board restructured the SATs this year so this comparison we're no longer able to use trend data per se for the current SATs however I did want to show a comparison um, and discuss a little bit about what this might look might have looked like if we had used trend data so in the years prior uh, we were at the high 400s low 500s in both reading and math. So about 501, 503 in the last few years, a touch higher in reading than we were in math. So that shows that we had about a 25 to 50 point increase on this new test. And that's just recalibration with the test. Also year over year, we were scoring about five to 10 points lower than the state. 
So in this uh, current year, we are within two points of the state in reading and math and 15 points, I'm sorry, reading and writing and 15 points in math. And so what it shows is that we are about where we were um, by ratio with math as compared to PHS to the state in reading, we're much closer to the state than we were in the past. So again, it, it's hard to uh, <laughs> compare apples to oranges, uh, but we seem to be pretty much in line with where we were compared to the state. Um, and again, our students are well prepared based on their SATs in the new, uh, in the new configuration. We did have uh, almost 200 students that were tested uh, that took part of uh, this new SAT as seniors last year. We continue to have strategies for improvement at the high school level to make sure that we're meeting the needs of the students. One of the big improvements in the SAT process was the addition of Khan Academy and the direct correlation with Khan Academy and how students can take the time to log in after they have received their SAT or their PSAT results. and. Uh, get set up practice for themselves uh, that is self-monitored and self-regulated, but then College Board will grade their assignments and the Khan Academy will grade their assignments and they'll track their progress and give them targeted preparation for their next SAT if they're choosing to take it again. Uh, we also have several st staff members who have been working on getting up to date on the current math and English as well as a college count or school counselor rather who has been working um, by visiting a College Board workshop make sure that we're aware of what's going on with the new changes for the SAT. We skipped 18 to all the all Um, so AP and dual enrollment are other uh, ways that we make sure that we are college and career ready. Uh, AP are courses that are designed by the College Board and they are consistently administered the courses across the nation and outside of the nation to make sure that the content of each of the courses is structured and is um, up to the standards that the College Board has for the advanced placement courses. Students who take the course then can opt to take a test associated with it and a student score in a certain range may be eligible for college credit based on their results. Dual enrollment classes are those courses that we offer at the high school where one of our teachers or an instructor from a local community college may teach the course and students earn high school credit as well as community college credit. And then of course we do have governor's students that were enrolled in our governor's school and um, this one does not include code RV8 because this was 1617 data. Um, so you can see that we consistently are having about uh, a little over 20% of our students who are <coughs> AP courses, um, or AP, AP tests rather, out of the 25% of our students who are taking AP courses. Um, and again, that generally that drop off of number of tests taken versus number of course offered is generally for students who are taking multiple AP courses, may have taken one or two in a subject area and may not need the AP credit uh, the senior year and so they don't take the actual test. But it is a nice high rate as far as total percentage of our students who are enrolled in a course that are actually taking the test. Um, and then our dual enrollment classes, uh, we know that we took um, a drop off after the 13-14 school year um, and that was due to just lower enrollment in some of our outside courses. We will see an increase in that for our 17-18 year significantly because of the ACA program. Um, but we also then will see a lower number of students who are enrolled in an AP course because some of the students who are in the dual enrollment for ACA are not in the AP. So these numbers will shift a little bit this coming school year. Yes? Excuse me. Um, so is AP test taken the same as AP test passed? No. So those numbers, um, we do have those numbers as well as far as numbers of students who get a 3, 4, or 5. Uh, the AP test is scored on a one to five scale. It depends on the college or university as to whether they will take a, uh, an AP credit based on the score. Some will take threes, some will take fours, some will take five, some will take none. Um, so it just depends on what school um, you apply to as to whether they will take the AP credit that you earned by taking the test. I will say too that just by taking the AP course, that is what's providing the students with the rigor um, and the consistent curriculum to make sure that they're college ready. So while we certainly want students to be taking the AP test so that they can, um, if possible, use that for college credit, 
the real benefit is actually taking the rigorous course, the AP course. Well, we can get you to take on how the students did on the AP test, if that's what you're asking. Yes, yes. yes. I'd like to. Yes, sure.
have those two yes. foot rates. So you call that 911 operator if you want someone there in the middle of the day or the middle of the night. So thank well, you. Well, and when you really drive by a firehouse at night and, and you look in the, the actual firehouse, look at the number of high school kids that spend their time there in the evenings just volunteering. And so if, if there's an opportunity for us to be able to snag them and get them ingrained in the school in some way, <laughs> then, then we're, we're all about it. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you all very much. Thank you. Yes, uh, a couple items in the superintendent's report. The first is we're asking for approval for additional school board advisory committee members. Uh, the committee member is highlighted um, in special ed advisory committee, the new member, and then several um, new members for the career technical education advisory committee, uh, a committee that continues to grow and have um, some really great uh, breadth of participation across the community. For the approval for those uh, new members of the advisory committee. Do I have a motion for approval of our new committee members? I make a motion to approve the new uh, advisory committee members. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And Ms. Wilson, we need to note that we lost Mr. Walters about 5.30 p.m., so he is not part of this vote. So four members. Um, next item is to consider approval uh, for um, Powhatan Special Olympics to use a school bus and a school bus driver. Um, this is in accordance with policy EEAD and something that we do each year uh, to allow them to go to um, Special Olympics tournament. Do I have a motion for approval? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And the last item for this evening is a donation, a very generous donation for the Pocahontas uh, PTO to Pocahontas Elementary School uh, to purchase uh, in the amount of $1,836. <coughs> to purchase some level uh, literacy readers for students in grades kindergarten through third grade. Do I have a motion to accept that very generous donation? So moved. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 Yep. Um, Mr. Cole, would you read the, the meeting of closed session, please? Yes, ma'am. Recommend we enter into closed session pursuant to Code 2.3-3711A1 to discuss the employment, resignation, and leave of specific employees pursuant to Code 2.3-3711A2 and A4 to discuss the expulsion and school placement of specific students, Codes 2.2-3711A1, A2, and A4. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are in closed session. We reconvene the open session. Session. Second. All in favor? Second. I'll second it if you don't want to second it. Okay, you can second it, that's fine, and then read the, the um, certification. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Whereas the Valentine County School Board has convened a closed meeting on this date pursuant to an affirmative reported vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act. Where section 2.2-3712D of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by the sport that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law. Now therefore be it resolved that the Powhatan County School Board hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements by the Virginia law, by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which the certification applies, and only public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered. Uh, Aye. Aye. Okay. Need to consider approval of the personnel docket and addendum. I need a motion. A uh, motion for approval of the docket and addendum as presented. I need a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Next steps and follow up and board comments. We'll do them all together. This evening. I have two um, next steps, follow-up questions. Um, 
concerning VPN, virtual private networks. Um, is there a way we can block them from students' devices? And is it a violation of our code of conduct? We can block them. Am I allowed to answer? Yes, <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean Sorry. to just try to. Um, we actually can, they, they may be very well blocked now. That particular issue had not come up. Uh, typically with a VPN, um, it, it doesn't have to be. Typically it's, it's coming from outside of the network in, uh, but you could run a VPN, you know, from inside out if you had another network. But I'm almost positive that's blocked on the web filter now. So the quick answer is yes, we, we can block that and I can double check to make sure that is what? Is it against AUP to use the VPN? <clears throat> I'd have to double about? check on that specifically as far as whether it's in the policy. I don't, I don't know if you had a particular incident that you were concerned about, but that particular issue uh, had not come up. Of course, we do you know, general web filtering, but uh, no one had ever specifically asked about a VPN in particular before. Did you have a report? Yeah, because I, I, I didn't know. So, yeah. And I can actually, uh, I mean, I can, I can double check the filter uh, in the morning and I can let you know that answer tomorrow, but I'm almost positive that's blocked now because that sort of falls in the same category as the, the proxy servers and the relays and that sort of thing. So, uh, but that would be very easy to block. Let's hear, let's hear what, the, At the, the middle school, middle school. so that's, the, she wants to remain, remain anonymous, but like they can, she figured out how he doesn't know his math because apparently they can get it from this VPN, how to do it or something, and then like put in information to get answers. Yes, okay. and so so that's what she was concerned about. Um, so I said I um, that I would find out. Yep. Okay. Sure. If, it, if it helps, okay. I just connected to my work. Let me. Okay, you you may have some special privileges. Yes, I will. The other thing was um, <laughs> the, the the vague threats versus the regular threats and the safety and how do we um, like? I had one call from a parent who um, got upset that the high school was um, notified. And she didn't want to send her children, her children go to Flat Rock, and why didn't we let them know, and, and that whole thing. And so safety is a big to do. Um, could we um, ask, um, well, I, I would like to invite Chair Fennelman at our um, next meeting. He said he'd be more than happy to talk to us about different um, threats and safety and, and that. And I, I just would like to talk about what we can talk about openly because their parents are concerned about why we're not letting everybody know. And I understand why we don't want to let everybody know, but she says she thinks we're shooting ourselves in the foot because then it goes crazy um, on social media and, you know, the, the mom's groups and all that. Right. So that was my um, request from her. I, Sheriff Nunley doesn't make those decisions, so we could ask Sheriff Nunley to come, but that's really a decision that, you know, that, that we make as an administration um, when to notify people of threats and that type of stuff. Sometimes we get information from the Sheriff's Department um, or recommendations from the Sheriff's Department, but most of the time um, it's the, the, the administration that makes those decisions. So um, you always walk a line, you want to be um, forthcoming of information, but you also don't want to um, alarm people unnecessarily. Um, so uh, we spend a lot of time when we have time um, in these situations trying to come up with wording that's accurately reflects the situation within the parameters of what we can share um, or the information that we have at that time. So I understand um, the concern uh, we're always going to um, notify the people that are under that particular threat. Um, and in this particular situation, if you're referring to the threat at the high school, there was no threat 
directed towards Flat Rock <coughs> School. That's so, what I have said, right. but I, I'm, I'm just letting you know what she had said I'm to saying, me. And so, I, got, um, I got a couple calls to the same effect, and I told them that if there is a threat that is imminent for their school or a particular school that we would notify them, but there, I don't see any resource to notify the whole community if their child doesn't go to that particular <coughs> school. Well, I guess what she was saying is the high school, Flat Rock Elementary is so close to the high school, if somebody is going to do something, that, but we know, or you know, well, yep. at the time, that it wasn't. Right. So that's what I, I, I don't know. Is, have any of you gotten any responses? Okay, so what, what you make, how do I know what a threat is or what a, you know, who, who explains that? You guys just decide, when you decide it's a threat? We decide, or? we decide if it's a threat and then we decide um, based on information that we have and sometimes in communication with the Sheriff's Department. Um, if there's a threat out there, then we would make a determination about notifying the community and um, what to, what we can say as a result of that. Um, so at that point, um, I'm trying to dance the line between okay. what we can share. Well, that's what I want to know. Can right. we discuss it as a, um, we can't discuss it as a discussion? Then maybe I'll, I'll just... Uh, I think it may, if, if we want to discuss it maybe in closed session so that we can talk about a specific um, situation and then that may give the board some more insight in terms of why certain terminology was used or that type of thing and, and then if the board decides we want to take a different direction then we could have that discussion. Well it's just been coming up a lot, yeah. a short pump middle and it's, it's becoming more frequent all around the world and so <coughs> Yes, thank you. Mr. Cole? Um, I, I had something that I can't remember. I was thinking about what, what Mr. Ball said. I, I lost entirely what like I was going to say. He may come back. I may think of okay, it. It may be next week or 2 o'clock this morning. I understand that perfectly. <laughs> Mr. Cunningham. Well, I'm sorry about giving you too much time. I have nothing at this time. <laughs> <laughs> Fall Festival of Flat Rock this Thursday. Bad year eight, and have come and have fun. I'll be driving the hay wagon dressed as a chicken. That's a fun My comment only was this from Madam Chairman was yeah. simply that the report that was done tonight is there a way to feature that on our web page rather than buried it in our school board report? You know, the report, the report on the achievement. Yep. I, I just think it'd be good to have on the you know, front of the web page. A lot of good things there. I really commit to, you know, to mm -hmm. the folks who are responsible for that. You know, that uh, I think we need to let people know a lot of good things going on. And that might be something that they can look at when they first, when they first get to the web page. So. Um, the only thing I had, and I already uh, asked Dr. Jones, would be um, to recognize uh, Coach Woodson for his. Uh, outstanding accomplishment and accomplishments over the years. Um, he was recognized in the local paper and Richmond Times Dispatch and um, it was, it, it's well deserving of recognition. Um, the other thing that I was going to talk about is just the health care plans and I think that we were, I had kind of touched on it that we were, I think we were all in agreement that when these plans are reviewed, I think it needs to be mandatory for employees to attend. And in the, I actually think that people that are not employees but are on plans, like, I mean, that, <coughs> I mean, I would like to know more about some of the plans. Um, I, and even on the information we got, the HSA was mentioned, but it didn't have any, um, you know, any really full information on it. Um, the cost, uh, you know, I have a lot of questions about that myself. Um, and I don't, I didn't really understand when he answered the question about the county, if, and this is just, you know, 
theoretically speaking, if this board decided to do away with the extended plan and just go with the 250 or 500, the county would have to do that also. Um, we can do the wellness plan or the health savings account without the county. Okay. But if we wanted to offer another plan, another level of plan, or replace a plan, or delete a plan, or delete a plan, then the county would need to agree to that as well. I've sent this presentation to Ted Borgie so he was able to see it. I've asked him for us to be able to talk about it. He may want to invite Mr. Rowe to his board meeting, but I said it's probably a conversation we need to have added to the agenda for our next joint meeting. Okay. Um, our goal tonight is just to give you some different options and to bring the board up to date. Uh, we'll begin pricing out some of those options. We don't have a health savings account right now, so there's okay. nothing to share. We'd have to create it some of the different parameters for the okay. board to review and approve if, if that's the direction we want to go. So that's the work that we'll be doing over the next month or two and be bringing additional information back to you. Okay. It's all, it's all very interesting. Madam Chair, if I could ask a question. Yes. If, if, if we could figure out some numbers for us, uh -huh. that would be a hypothetical if we eliminated the top tier plan. Okay. How that might uh, improve the rates for the remaining plans, maybe that would be the information. All right. And um, something, I don't know if this is on the schedule um, either, um, and I'm sure it is part of the budget as I know this, but um, the what we've had a couple people speak on, the um, equity, the equality in our rates and the county rates, and um, I definitely think we need more information on that and the ability to talk about that because I think, uh, you know, when you're, that's one component of everything that we would have to be equal with the county on. Right. And just personally, I think it's it's almost an impossibility because we have, we have, we have time off that county employees don't get off. We have nine month employees that the county may not have. So, it's almost impossible to have equality all across the board. And if you're going to have equality in insurance rates, then you're going to have equality in vacation time or earning time or, you know, and I, so anyway, it just, I think it's a, it's a, it's the whole picture. Right. And I don't think we can just pluck out one thing that I would like, um, you know, more. We'll, we'll be happy to give you more information. Mr. Borges and I, when we met last week, just a, a monthly update meeting, we talked about that and, you know, we were both in agreement that these are two different workforces, um, two different uh, sets of employees that have different job responsibilities, um, contracts, everything, that um, that bringing it in total alignment um, would be probably cost prohibitive um, and also may not make the most sense in terms of serving those employees. So um, we can look at this, uh, maybe a um, blessing in disguise is uh, this threat of a huge increase because it may, um, we may be changing our health care more drastically and that would give us an opportunity to get more in line in terms of um, employer contribution rates. Okay, that's fine. And that's all I have. Uh, the only thing I wanted to share. I was just going to say your idea about having it at a faculty meeting. Yes. I thought it was excellent because you had, at the end of the day, teachers are tired yep. and, you know, go to a meeting. They have to go because of other reasons, right. then so I think that's a perfect Thank you. idea. Yeah, we will definitely do that regardless of whether we make any changes or not, because I do think it's something we need to spend some more time going over. I um, just wanted to share with the board, and, and you all are aware the elementary realignment committee's been working. We've met twice now. Um, we're finalizing um, three plans to put out to the public. Um, uh, the committee's done some great work and given us good feedback and uh, the reason we haven't put the plans out yet is because they gave us some little tweaks of different areas based on their knowledge of the community. Uh, so the consultant is working on finishing up those plans. They will be posted on the county's GIS site, which is you can search your address and manipulate the map some to see where the boundaries are. So it, it's a more interactive process than just a flat map. <coughs> and uh, but we'll have directions on our website. We will then give the community a chance to give us feedback on those three plans. That we'll collect that feedback. We'll share it with the committee. We'll, we'll share it with the board. 
um, and then come back to, to you all um, with an update um, likely in November. Will that be a recommendation? I don't think time? at this point it will be a recommendation. I think we will um, update. It will be an update on where we are in the process. I think that um, we're going to need an additional opportunity for community input to make sure we don't rush input from the community. There's really no we said we wanted to finish it by December. If it bleeds to January, we should be giving families plenty of notice. I'd rather us take the time and uh, make sure there are no surprises for the community. I agree. I think you've all done a great job. And from the information that, that we have, that's a lot of work that yes. went very quickly. Mm -hmm. So thank you all and thank them for that. That's all I have. Is there anything else from anyone? If not, motion to adjourn. Oh, do you need something? Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all.